Hello, good evening, everyone. I hope everybody's doing well. Once again, my name is Ali Hamedi with uh, TechMill, and we are continuing on with our webinar series focused on the futures market and the products that are available, the securities and sectors within the futures market and the capital markets. I hope everybody has had a good trading week this last week since we last spoke on Tuesday of last week. And in continuation of our theme of what we're going to be discussing uh, in today's webinar uh, is specifically the copper market and the futures outlook from various analysts and forecasts across the uh, market and investment firms. Uh, that being said, uh, we've had a lot of volatility, as we all have seen and and uh, are seeing in the market currently, as we speak right now, the market's down a bit. It's about down 200 points, the Dow 44, 45 points on S&P. And currently, as we speak right now, copper uh, spot is around 37, uh, sorry, 3.75. Uh, that being said, we'll get into today's future, uh, futures webinar on the copper's market and looking at the various forecasts and, and perspectives. Now, this was a snapshot taken earlier today of the spot market uh, of copper's futures. Let me make this a little bit bigger for us so we can all see it. And at the time of this particular snapshot, it was at three spot seven six. It's right now at three spot seven five. So about the same from the time when uh, this particular slide was put in the presentation. That gives us an outlook or a picture, a depiction of where the copper market is as we speak in today's market. Now, if we roll out to, I have two charts for us to look at. The first one here on the left is the December uh, of 2022 futures contract. And the one on the right is July, sorry, June of uh, July, 2023 contract. Uh, the price on the, on the December, June, uh, December 22 contract is trading at three spot 8055 and for one year out, it's trading at three spot seven eight nine zero. Uh, what can we depict and what can we learn and gain from these particular two contracts that we're looking at, knowing that the current spot price is trading at three spot seven five? Uh, you don't see too much movement in these two contracts six months out from now and even 12 months out from now. Um, from my perspective, uh, throughout the years that I've been involved in the market, uh, which have been quite a few, uh, it tells me two things. One, uh, there's quite a bit of supply in the market. And two, they're waiting to see what's going to happen on the demand side uh, regarding supply chain disruptions uh, coming out of China and various countries within South America. And more specifically, what's going to happen with the EV market, the electronic vehicle market, uh, since it will have uh, a considerable amount of, uh, let's say, I don't want to say ramifications, but it will have good uh, perspective on the needs as the forecast for the EV market continue to uh, go out to 2025 and 2030. Now it's been predicted that by 2030, 50% of the automobile market will be an EV vehicle. Now, if that stands true, then uh, the demand for copper in particular uh, will grow considerably over the years uh, as it is one of the main ingredients or uh, let's say uh, materials used for the EV markets. But the EV market is only one particular sector uh, as there are many revolving around uh, the copper market. But if you're looking now at where the spot price is, six months out, it's only five points. The futures contract 
uh, above where the current price is. And then if you go out a full 12 months from now, it's only three points uh, uh, above the current spot price. So that tells me quite a bit just from looking at the particular chart from a technical perspective. But we're going to discuss further now. Uh, for those of you that have been following along throughout the series, I like to keep the webinar uh, discussion in an informal conversational manner so that we can get or I can at least get the points across in a more understandable way so it's not too technical and written with the financial terminology that can get you uh, or could make you confused. If we get into what analysts uh, from various uh, companies, uh, firms, analytical firms, banks, financial firms, etc. Uh, like we did last week with gold, I'm going to give you various perspectives from across the market, uh, from an analytical perspective of what their outlook for uh, copper is in particular. Uh, from tradingeconomics.com, uh, they're expecting uh, copper to trade at four spot 21 four dollars and 21 cents per pound by the end of this quarter well the end of this quarter literally is the end of this week and it's trading at three spot seven five so that gives you an idea not to say that trading in economics is worthless and they don't know what they're doing and they're not worth taking a look at it's quite the contrary it's more information for us to digest and uh, to analyze. Now, looking forward, they estimate it to trade down to three spot nine five in 12 months' time. So the 12 month contract is trading at three spot seven eight, according to the, to the previous slide that I was showing. Their forecast 12 months out is at three spot nine five, and their current quarterly outlook is at $4.21. Uh, since four spot two one when it's trading right now uh, at three spot seven five. But according to the graph, if you look at the chart, at, at the spot chart, um, it has stopped its downward trend and is trying to pull back a bit. So we could see what happens over the next uh, couple of days. But four spot 21 uh, is a bit of a stretch and reach, in my opinion, but nothing is impossible, as we all know anything can happen in the marketplace. From, uh, get this out of the way, from capital.com, uh, the copper market climbed to a five week high at the end of last week. Now this is, when I say dated material, this is dated within the month of July. Uh, as the prospect of tightening supply out of Latin America coincided with China or Shanghai's reopening from the COVID lockdown. What recent volatility, what does recent volatility mean for the market for the rest of 20, 2022? We will look at the current market drivers and review future copper price predictions from key analysts. Now, they go on to say that traders liquidated their long positions as macroeconomic data from China showed the impact of lockdowns on consumption. And despite government stimulus and reduced regulatory pressure in the housing sectors, Sales of new homes in 23 major cities dropped 33% year on year during the five day national holiday in early May. It continues, housing construction is one of the biggest consumers of copper for wiring, plumbing and home appliances. Now that goes back to being one of the different sectors within the copper market itself outside of the EV electronic vehicle market that I mentioned uh, just a few moments ago as we got the webinar started. So if we look at this particular data, it's basically telling us, okay, there are issues with Latin America coinciding with China reopening from their lockdown. They've had an elongated lockdown recently. I think it lasted uh, five or six weeks and they're coming out of it now. Uh, but there has been a drop in uh, a severe drop, basically, at 33%. That's not a small drop by any means uh, in, in new homes across 33, uh, 23 major cities. Uh, so with that being said, with the demand for housing or new homes being built, uh, that's going to put a decrease on demand in the copper market uh, as well. 
Moving on to other analysts. This is from the Deutsche Bank Saxo, uh, Saxo Bank itself. They noted that the price broke through, now we're de dealing with technical analysis here from their perspective, uh, through a technical resistance at $4.35 to reach $4.55 with the reopening of the Chinese government releasing new guidelines to accelerate clean energy growth, including the construction of major wind and solar farm projects. Now, analysts at Saxo, specifically named uh, Kim Larson, noted that the relative strength index, otherwise the RSI, closed above the 60 threshold back to positive territory and confirming the upward trend. Now, once again, this is information and data, analytical data coming from this particular month of June, and they are looking at more of an upward trend based on the reopening of China and at the same time, the acceleration of their clean energy uh, uh, political agenda uh, for growth within the clean energy and solar uh, sector. Uh, once again, copper is also a major ingredient or component within these materials needed, raw materials needed to enhance and make these projects viable. From Zayner, which is, let me just make this a little, there we go. Uh, their forecast coming out of end of first quarter, basically. Uh, copper prices should see support from the news that Chilean copper production in April declined a whopping 8.9%. That's also a very big decline. In their opinion, copper bulls need consistent optimism flowing from equities to extend the recent rally. Now, what they're referring to here now, the correlation between the equity markets to help bolster and hold up uh, any type of bullish trend that copper uh, is looking for uh, will need to come from a positive and bullish trend, uh, uh, sentimentism, if you want, market sentiment uh, from the equity markets, which we all know at the moment over the course of this particular month in June has not been taking place. Now we've seen a couple of days where we've seen rallies in the equity markets, uh, you know, pop up a couple of percentage points. And then again, you know, yesterday was a positive day, but then we look at the markets today, it's again down. So we're in choppy territory. Uh, and in my opinion, uh, choppy territory with downward sentiment, uh, which is the, complete opposite of what copper bulls and Zayner's analytical perspective is looking for from a consistent uh, uh, bullish trend for the copper market for it to continue in its upward trend. If we look at uh, Scotiabank out of Canada, their long-term forecast had the price table at an average of $4.25 a pound or in point terminology, four spot, two, five points in both 20 and 20, 2022 and 2023. So here they've taken more of, let's say, a conservative uh, analytical outlook in the sense that they're not giving us a specific uh, target range for a range or a time period that consists of 18 months. Now that's a quite a bit of time for uh, any type of analyst not to give any specific direction in between. They're just basically saying from here until end of 2023, we expect the price of copper to hover around four spot 25 plus or minus. So then again, this is just more information and more data for us to uh, digest and look at stored in our mental capacity in the filing cabinet as we continue to do research across this particular sector uh, with this particular uh, metal itself and see or decide on if this is something that one, we want to put in our portfolio, two, if we currently already have exposure to copper in our portfolio, how to protect it or hedge 
uh, depending on uh, what type of position you currently have uh, in your portfolio. And three, uh, the outlook of, in general, if you're looking at, they're focusing, if you pay attention to the wording that the analysts in the previous slides have discussed, they're talking about due to ABC, XYZ out of specific countries, uh, you know, uh, COVID pandemic lockdown uh, opening up uh, due to uh, growth and clean energy sector uh, projects being lifted off uh, due to market sentiment. If you notice, they'll always use some sort of, let's say, uh, 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 an introduction as to why they think copper is going to do up, down, or stay sideways in the market based on other market uh, related matters. So from this perspective, they are saying, okay, Scotiabank for the remainder of this year, remainder of 2023, for the next 18 months, we're expecting copper to stay uh, around the plus or minus four spot two five. And as we spoke earlier, you know, it was trading at three spot uh, seven five uh, at the, at, well, this is happening, our webinar. From the World Bank, now this is getting a little more uh, into the semantics and details that you could really use as a determining factor in whether you want to take a position uh, in, in copper futures uh, specifically and or to hedge what you have in your current portfolios, depending on what you're invested in. Now, the copper market, according to the World Bank, has been affected by water shortages. Here we go. Here we, we're talking about those semantics again. We have water shortages in Chile, labor disputes in Peru. Copper prices are projected to increase 8% in 2022 as constraints in Chile and Peru persist. And as, as one of China's major smelters is facing credit issues. So when we look at the uh, credit issues that are facing China, now we're looking at the macroeconomic level. Okay, that, that has several different elements to take into consideration and it's not only focused on the copper market per se. So you have to understand when you read that, how you digest it and keep it in context. Prices are expected to ease in 2023, which means when they say ease, tend to produce a downtrend. Uh, however, as new projects come online, including in Chile, the De Democratic Republic of Congo, Mongolia, and Peru, upside risks to the outlook include further supply disruptions in Russia, while a more severe slowdown in, a slowdown in global growth poses the greatest risk. So from World Bank's perspective, they are looking at a possible short-term bump. Here they specifically say an 8% uh, bump in 2022, but then again, getting into the semantics and details, citing several different countries here, where we're talking about Chile, Peru, China, Democratic Republic of Congo, Mongolia, and Russia, due to all those issues that each one of these geographic locations are going through. Uh, some of them could be overlapping, some of them dif different and uh, completely different in of themselves uh, are going to provide a greater slowdown and downturn or downside risk to the copper market, which means in 2023, if you wanted to specifically only use this particular piece of data from the World Bank, then you're looking at a downturn in the copper market, uh, lower prices from where they are now by the end of 2023. Now, once again, we've got a lot of time to cover, a lot of ground to cover between now and end of 2023. And we're talking about uh, one and a half years uh, it's 18 months. A lot of things can happen in 18 months. There's a lot of speculation uh, as to what may happen with the U.S. market. 
Are we going to get into a recession? Are we not? Are we going to flirt with the recession and avoid it with a soft landing? Um, a lot of the things that I've been reading and have been coming across is that the Fed may end up just giving up on the actual battle against inflation and realize that they're late to the game, but they will do the best they can to ensure a soft landing versus a hard landing. If you get into a hard landing, then we're getting into recessionary territory, which would propel it into an actual recession. And what a recession is, is when you have slowing growth uh, over two consecutive quarters, uh, that information is lagging. You know, that's not information that we have uh, on the spot up to date to tell us where the GDP is specifically as of today, uh, June 28th, 2022. The information that's always provided by the government uh, has a lag. So by the time we are in a recession, that information, once it's released, will only validate if we are in a recession or not. So we have to do our research, getting back to everything that I've been talking about regarding your specific portfolio, what you're looking to do with your financial investment uh, accounts or account itself uh, revolves around doing as much due diligence as we can, trying to put together the writing on the wall that could be right in front of us. Maybe it's obvious sometimes uh, more obvious than others, uh, which can be difficult when it's not as obvious. So uh, specifically speaking, getting back on topic with the copper market, most of the analysts that we've come across in these examples in this particular webinar are showing more of, uh, let's say a price easing, a downturn, uh, more supply in the market than the demand at the moment due to a number of reasons getting back to the semantics. If we look at uh, ING, a bank out of uh, the Netherlands, uh, the support authorities should increase the odds that the renewable energy sector will continue to see strong growth and support the demand for copper and aluminum. Now, what have I been showing you on the previous slides? Information and data coming from uh, the semantics, details from various countries, uh, various analysts, various financial firms, giving their reason as to why they feel that copper could see easing between now and basically out as far as end of 2023. Now, here we have ING, which is a very well-known uh, bank throughout Europe uh, and globally for that matter. And here they're coming out saying they, due to the renewable energy sector, okay, they continue to see strong growth and support the demand for copper and aluminum, which is the contrary to what we've seen on the previous slides. So this goes back again as I have mentioned to uh, you earlier in previous webinars, you can't just stick to one source of data and information and make your calculations only off of that one source. You've got to look at the market as a whole. It's constantly moving. And at the same time, uh, there are variables that neither you or I will ever have any control over, such as geopolitical risk, like we've seen what happened between uh, Russia and uh, Ukraine. And at the same time, what's somewhat forecastable and manageable with what the Fed is doing with the interest rate hikes in the United States, while we're seeing the market down, you know, plus or minus 20% on the S&P 500 year to date, if that gets into an actual recession, we'd like again, once again, we have to wait for the data to come out. So there's gonna be a lag there. Uh, you could see an additional 20 to 30% downside on the S&P 500 if they're not available, if they're not able to avoid a hard landing. Now, if the soft landing comes into play, 
now we're talking into the macroeconomic picture again. What will the Fed do Q1 2023? Well, there's possibility if their predictions and their you know, forecast and foresight is on the money from their perspective, because you have to remember, like I told you last webinar, the United States Federal Reserve, their sole responsibility is to maintain US dollar and US government economic policy. Not the Hasatr. They that is it. That is their sole objective. Okay. So if they're trying to steer this train wreck, that's possible train wreck that's happening before them as we speak due to inflation and slowing growth supply chain management disruptions etc cetera, etc cetera. and we get into a soft landing uh, territory for them to maneuver the fed meaning for them to maneuver then by q1 2023 we could see quantitative easing coming back into play because Shuana in 2024, from a U.S. perspective, in 2024, it's an election year. And not that we're here to talk politics, but it is intertwined with the economics and the markets. So from a Democratic perspective, which the De Democratic Party has uh, control of the White House at the moment, uh, the sentiment right now is not that positive out of the US. US markets are struggling. And the Democratic Party, if they continue to let things move along as they have been since they've taken office post uh, Trump, then they're going to be in a world of pain in the 2024 elections. So not that we are gamblers or, or betters, but I can assure you that the White House from a political perspective is going to try to apply pressure on the Fed for the US markets to provide some sort of short term because we do have a very short term memory as humans, specifically when it comes to investing uh, in, in the capital markets so that come election time 2024, uh, they need some positive news, and that could come from printing more money, which would mean quantitative easing, which means there's more money in the market, which would pump straight back into the markets. And then we could see a turnaround in 2024 from, I don't know, a downward cycle of 20, 30, maybe 40% on the S&P 500, possibly. But all of these are affecting every specific sector that we're discussing. Now, getting back into copper, I didn't mean to get off on a tangent, but from a conversation, I like to keep things conversational, is that keeping your eye on the big picture, understanding what's happening around what you're interested in and being able to map and put together a, uh, a better understanding of what's taking place, specifically today within copper, the market, the, the demand is going to come back. Uh, the previous analysts are saying that they're seeing no demand due to X, Y, Z, A, B, C. There's more supply, so they're going to see more downward uh, pressure and easing on the price throughout 2022 to 2023. And then here we get an analyst coming out of ING saying that they do see strong, uh, that's a very powerful word if you read in between the lines they don't see they're not saying we see growth we see strong growth and support for the demand in the copper and aluminum market so is this going to happen yes it's going to happen when is it going to happen nobody knows um, as we all know the uh, the global markets along with geopolitical agendas, we're all pushing for cleaner energy, renewable energy, and copper is a major, major, major ingredient in this sector. So when it does take off, 
it's not a matter of if, it's just a matter of when, then you're going to see copper prices fly. Uh, it's just nobody can time the market ever uh, at all perfectly. It's just a matter of understanding your surroundings, what's taking place. And if you want to start building your futures portfolio in a time where prior to this particular slide, analysts are, are, are looking at downward trend and easing in the, in the copper market, then usually from an investment manager's perspective like myself, when, when you're investing, you always would rather invest on the low end and sell at the high end. So you've heard the buy low, sell high. Uh, you can never buy at the lowest and sell at the highest. So this is a, a prime opportunity to take a look at this particular uh, security, copper in, in specific, do your research and, and see what you come up with. This one coming from Wallet Investor, uh, here's another bullish forecast for them. Uh, their forecast is bullish in the long term, predicting that the price could reach as high as five dollars and forty cents per pound by end of 2023, up from four dollars and seventy seven cents at the end of 2022, rising a further six dollars and six eight eighty to six dollars and sixty eight cents by the end of 2025, and up to seven dollars and fifty eight cents in five years time. So. Here we have an extremely bullish forecast. You can take the ING's sentiment from the previous slide where they see strong growth and demand due to renewable energy projects that will be uh, coming into play. And then here we have this particular forecast coming from Wallet Investor where it's just nothing but an uptick they're, they're predicting by the, the year from now, uh, sorry, six months from now, it should be, according to them, at four, four spot 77. Well, where it was trading currently, it's at 376. It was at 375 at the beginning of the webinar. It's up to 376, 60 as we speak now. So it's got to move, it's got to move a full point by year 2022. And then from there, it's gonna move up according to them by end of 2023, an additional, what's that 40 plus 23, another 63 uh, uh, basis points uh, for it to reach its 542 target. And then from there, 2025 and 20 and, uh, and five years time to 758, it's nothing but an upward trend. Now that does not mean by any means that you're going to see the graph just move up with no volatility, no choppiness whatsoever. So do not take it by any means in context that it's just going to be a one, one way uh, arrow in an upward uh, tick or, or, or trend without any volatility or choppiness. Now, are they going to be accurate? Only time will tell. Only time will tell for all of them. Uh, but this is an extremely bullish forecast. So if you're a copper bull and you're reading this or seeing this and you're saying, wow, you know, it's trading at 376, you know, I can get, uh, you know, one year out from now, 12 months time. I think that if I recall right on the previous slide here, uh, it was trading 378, okay, 12 months from now, uh, you can get a 12, uh, tw in July of 2023, you can get a futures contract for 378. And here they're saying by uh, end of 23, it could be 542. You know, it seems like heck of a deal, but you gotta be careful. You gotta tread very carefully. Um, and again, look at all of the data. The key takeaways from the copper market overview, um, as we've seen from various analysts, the, car, the, the copper market seems to be well supplied in 2022 
And based on this surplus is expected to continue over the two years. Now, I put this as a key takeaway because I didn't include every single piece of data and information that I came across while putting together this particular webinar. But in doing what I do within the markets, um, there is a lot of supply of, car of copper in the market. And this is why you see more analysts and more forecasts uh, on the easing side and, and, and bearish uh, on the price side in the shorter term, uh, at least over the next six months, uh, based on this particular surplus. Even though a rise in demand is anticipated, which I just discussed a few, or just a few minutes earlier, this will not be enough to supply, uh, to, to absorb the increase in supply. Uh, this is nothing more than short-term analytical uh, uh, crunching, if you will, where we will have growth in the renewable energy sector, uh, growth in the EV sector, growth uh, at some point in time in the housing market. The housing market in the US is slumping. Uh, the housing market in China is slumping. It had a very big slump. Um, but when the housing market stabilizes uh, and it turns back into a buyer's market, then you're going to see a huge demand for uh, copper specifically. So uh, those are just some of the, the, the key sectors that need this particular element uh, and, and metal. Uh, for these projects and uh, sectors to take off. And like always, do your research. This is a cl classic example of a lot. I put a lot, several analysts forecasting more supply in the market, which in turn could drive the price down over the remainder of 2022 and into 2023. So uh, where it stands right now, if you take a look at the copper markets, graph specifically i'm going to expand it here on my other screen i mean from the time it hit you know the 480 to, to 485 mark plus or minus you know it dropped down all the way and that hit back end of may beginning of uh, sorry end of april beginning of may it drops from that high down to 403 in mid-May. Then, a, I don't know if you want to call it a, a bull trap, but it gave us a short-term spike during the course of May, and it spiked back up to 455, 457. But since that high, um, until we're speaking right now, if you look at its, its, its chart, it's done nothing but plummet, literally like a rock in water. There has been no rebound until possibly where we are now discussing uh, this webinar this evening. It's dropped from 457 uh, on June 6th to where we are today at 376 over the course of what, 20, 22 days, 21 days, um, and I don't know, has it found a floor? We, we've seen two green candlesticks uh, over the last couple of days, providing maybe some light, uh, not at the end of the tunnel, but light in terms of this particular chart that it may have reached this particular bottom and provide us a little bit of a push uh, back into an uptrend, but if you can take a look at this, the sentiment, if you look at the chart overall, um, it is a bearish chart. And this does support a lot of what the analysts were saying, getting back to more supply in the market than demand due to getting into semantics from different or several uh, geographic uh, locations globally and getting into specific market sectors, specifically housing, itself and the uh, uh, renewable energy and growth projects. So um, this is what I have for this evening uh, regarding copper. And I always like to leave on a, a quote. This one's from Warren Buffett, 
Um, I'm sure most of you know who he is. If not, um, he's in his 90s now, but he's very, he's the CEO and chairman of Berkshire Hathaway, and he's a very famous uh, American investor and philanthropist uh, known for his, his classic uh, investment strategies. And here he gets into his quote, wide diversification is only required when investors do not understand what they are doing. Uh, and that goes back to what we have mentioned literally from day one uh, of understanding what the futures contracts are, how, what compromises, what they're comprised of, um, how they operate in the capital markets, who uses them, why they're used, and then it gets into market practice. And now we're starting in to get into the market outlook and so forth. Um, when managing money, you have, you should have uh, a very specific strategy in mind around what you know. And the only way you can get to that specific what you know level of understanding is by engaging and as much information and data and research as you possibly can within what you want to know and what you know and learn more about it and stay very focused. Because uh, if you start getting scattered and you've got contracts across several different sectors um, uh, that, that may or may not even be correlated with one another and you're trying to diversify the portfolio, so that you know if something goes up you hope that the other the if something goes down rather that some other area in your portfolio will go up and you know will hedge out but the territory that we're in now and why i put this particular comment is we are at a very dangerous predicament within the capital markets specifically from the u.s uh, markets themselves we've inflation is too high the Fed is too late with raising rates. Um, and if they give up on the quantitative tightening and they start quantitative easing, easing again in Q1 and Q2 of 2023 to try to, uh, for political reasons or otherwise, uh, to try to uh, prop up the, the capital markets and try to increase GDP, um, they've printed too much money way too fast and at some point in time it, it you know it's like musical chairs when the music stops you're gonna you're gonna end up finding one chair uh, uh not enough and one chair less and it, you know you're gonna be out of the game and when we, when we say you're out of the game when you're dealing with futures because of their volatility, because of the way that they're priced, if you're not careful and understand what you're doing with your price targets, you know, you know, getting out of the game means you're liquidated out of the position and you've got to contemplate, you know, do I invest more money to get back into the markets or, or not? And uh, the markets are the markets and they operate the way that they operate and we can only do the best we can uh, in protecting ourselves and uh, doing and learning as much as we can about what we want to invest in. So that being said, that's what I have for tonight on copper. I'm going to open it up for Q&A. If anybody has any questions, uh, please go ahead. You can send them to me via uh, chat. See here. Do we have any questions? Perfect. Next week, I wish everybody the best of, of luck this particular week. Uh, happy trading. Uh, stay focused, stay attentive, and we will be again uh, continuing with the webinar series next week with uh, a different particular product within a different sector and we'll dig a little deeper with the analytics and the forecast of that particular uh, series next week. With that being said, have a good evening and uh, good night. Take care.